Good morning. Uh, welcome to Accelerating Communication in AEC with Unity Reflect. Uh, my name is Christopher Morse. I'm here with my colleague Adam. Uh, you probably saw him last night at the uh, keynote. Uh, and we're really excited, thanks to Unity, for letting us be here to share some of our work at SHOP and specifically some of our work with this new uh, amazing Reflect. So uh, first, before we actually get to the Reflect part, uh, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about our firm and, and our sort of design philosophy and, and why we're here and what we do with Unity and what we're going to be doing with Reflect. So Shop Architects, uh, we're based in New York City. Uh, we're in the Woolworth building here, and I always like to start with this slide uh, because it's really a great distillation of our design philosophy at Shop. When it was uh, finished in, in 1913, it was the tallest building in the world. So it was a technological marvel at the time, new technology in steel and construction. Uh, but it remains to this day one of the most beautiful buildings in the city, uh, a grand, beautiful mosaic tiled lobby, uh, terracotta facade. Uh, so it's really this combination of beauty and technology. And, and that same design philosophy uh, informs a lot of our work at Shop Architects. Uh, we have around 200 people in the office. We are primarily uh, do work in New York City in our backyard, but we are a global firm and we do have a number of projects all over the world. Um, our projects range in, in typology, in size, in program. So uh, in this case, a small maker lab in a, a school in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have some pavilions that are more experimental. This is a 3D printed pavilion uh, in Design Miami. Uh, we do exterior landscape parks. We do uh, cultural museums. This is on the, uh, the river in New York City. Uh, international buildings, so in Korea. Uh, we're also really interested in different types of material, so you know, wood, uh, the Uber headquarters, uh, glass, this is also in New York City, terracotta, uh, and again, looking at the sort of beautiful details of what can go into a building, uh, larger scale projects, uh, arenas, and international large scale projects in Botswana, uh, a lot of towers, and so you saw yesterday uh, a little bit uh, of this tower in Brooklyn, so it will be the tallest tower in Brooklyn when it's completed, uh, and so, as I said before, we're, we're interested in the beauty of buildings, but also the technology of how those buildings come together. Uh, so as a quick example, this is one of the earliest projects that the firm did. This is a MoMA PS1 courtyard. It's the Young Architects program that they do every year in the courtyard of the Art Museum in New York. Uh, so this is a pavilion that the, the partners use as a way to test new ideas uh, focused around construction and technology. Uh, in this case, they uh, appropriated a relatively common technology at the time in the, the late 90s. It was AutoCAD, uh, and they used it in, in an uncommon way to construct, uh, communicate the build. Uh, so for this project, the construction documents are actually over there on the right, and they're literally a one-to-one -one printed template of each slice of the pavilion. So what they would do is they would print out, plot out the one-to-one -one scale, then manually lay over the the wood, nail it together, and then put it up. And, and this process uh, allows us to reduce the set of drawings. It's, it's only this sort of direct communication of what we're actually building. It's not this complicated construction set of drawings. Uh, and so this, this innovation around uh, communicating, not just the beauty that we're designing, but how we communicate that design, how we construct that design is something that SHOP is always interested in all of our projects. Uh, we're looking around new ways to, to communicate, as I said before. So this idea of a kit of parts is something that we're really interested in. We also are very interested in looking at different, uh, different industries other than architecture and seeing what we can learn from them. So uh, the partners have a lot of influence from the automotive industry as well as the aerospace industry. And we like to ask the question of, of, can we build a building in the same way? So this here is actually a building. Uh, this is the Camera Obscura, another early project of shops from 2002. And uh, this was completely modeled in Rhino 3D, uh, down to every last bolt. Every part was modeled completely in Rhino. There were no sort of 2D construction drawings that you might normally have. Directly from that Rhino file, we 
created cut files to send to the fabricators to digitally cut all of the different parts. And then instead of creating construction drawings as you normally we have, we created these, these diagrams to, uh, to inform how the pieces would go together. Uh, and so this idea of, of innovation in, in that communication, in that uh, process of delivering the building, not just designing the building, is something that, that continues to inform a lot of our R&D efforts today. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically our role at SHOP and some of the things we work on. So we are on a team that is technically called interactive visualization. Basically what that means is we are connecting designs with data in new and interactive ways on a whole bunch of hardware. Um, and so what this R&D really means is it means that we get the opportunity to tie into all of the different teams around shop architects in really unique ways. Um, we get to work with design teams very closely as well as we get to work with uh, some of our back-end engineers and some of our um, visualization teams and some of our, um, even our production team in really, really unique ways to, you know, pull all of these different types of of information and visuals into these interactive environments. <clears throat> so we're building not only applications for, you know, uh, tablets, but for headset-based VR, AR, for web um, is, is really prevalent right now. Uh, so we do a whole range of things. And we build stuff with Unity. So here's a couple things we built with Unity. <laughs> um, so this is one of our on-site augmented reality applications for that nine to call Brooklyn Tower, where we actually built a custom uh, localization mapping system to um, determine where we're standing so that we can drop the building in the right position and look at it at one-to-one -one scale, um, as well as other one-to-one on-site augmented reality applications where we can actually walk through the space now using uh, Unity's AR Foundation um, in order to really get a feel for, you know, do we like this spatial feeling of these, of these designs? We can walk it before we build it as well as a whole bunch of other things. <laughs> um, some of them are, you know, we're, we're building for kind of a wide range of use cases. A lot of our time is R&D. Some of our time is actually going to build specific things for built projects. Um, but we're, we're really testing a, a, a wide array of, of different technologies. So, um you know, as a, as a small team, really, it's, it's just the two of us working in this firm uh, in, in this area of interactive visualization. And as I'm sure all of you know, there are a lot of challenges that come along with, with this workflow. Uh, it, some of these challenges that I'm going to talk about now are specific to architecture, but I'm sure that the broad strokes are applicable to, to any industry. Uh, so first is just sort of the, the tools that architects use. Um, I mean, the, the obvious starting point is all the different design software that our design team uses, whether that's Revit, Rhino, 3ds Max, Katia, parametric tools like Dynamo and Grasshopper. Uh, these are really the sort of the, the bread and butter of, of what our firm, the designers, what they're using from day to day. But they also use a lot of other uh, medium in order to explore and understand and, and analyze other designs, whether that's sketching, building models, drawing diagrams, or or these you know, photorealistic 2D renders, a lot of these are used, uh, I mean, certainly at the end to sort of communicate to clients or communicate to the public, but these are also used in the design process. Well, we'll go through a lot of iterations, uh, understanding design through sketch and through models uh, in all these different mediums. And so in, in our work in the digital realm, uh, the designers really ask us to, to produce the best tool that will let them solve the the problem at hand. So every building is unique. Unlike a car or unlike a plane, every single time we create a new product, it's a different product. It's a new thing in a new spot with a new client and new challenges. And so every single time, there's new questions that arise that our designers need to solve. And so they really are used to working in a lot of different ways to, to solve those problems. And so whether that's 
on an iPad or in the HoloLens or in VR, uh, that desire comes back onto us, and, and they really ask us to, to create a lot of different ways for them to, to investigate their problems. So in addition to all those different design tools, uh, we also work through the idea of iteration. Designers iterate and iterate and iterate again, uh, going through, I mean, they can go through hundreds of, of different possibilities in the design before narrowing it down to 10, but then it balloons back up to 20, and then it narrows it down. Uh, and so these different iterations, by the time we, we develop a tool for them to investigate a specific problem, you know, traditionally, the amount of time it takes to get it into Unity and, and develop the tool and deploy it, the design has already changed. And so we need to re-import, and then, and by the time we re-import, the design's changed again, and so we're constantly updating the models inside of Unity in order to get it to them uh, in, in the most current form that they, they need it in, in order to answer their questions. And then finally, we have the problem of handling all of the information. So, uh, this is not a teapot. This is a rendering of a teapot. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of lines and vertices that, that we as humans recognize as a teapot. But the actual geometry of this has no information about it being a teapot. Compare that to building information modeling, or BIM, uh, where everything has all sorts of metadata attached to it. Uh, when we model something, we need to know not just what it looks like, but what it's made out of, whether it's a column, or a beam, or a wall, or a window. We need to know how much it costs. We need to know material properties, structural properties, uh, all sorts of different things that are attached to that geometry. And in order to develop the effective tools, we really need to bring that information along with the geometry into Unity so that we can use that. Uh, and a lot of that information is not geometric. It can be abstract. Uh, and you know, the term digital twin is popular uh, in a lot of industries these days, so it's, it's sort of that idea of, of how do we have not just a geometry, but, but really building the entire building uh, in Unity. Uh, and for that, uh, an FBX export just doesn't cut it for us. Yeah, so now we'll talk about how Reflect is solving a lot of these problems. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that Reflect has a, as you guys have heard, uh, a native plugin into our BIM authoring software, Autodesk Revit, which means that unlike an FBX, it's not just pulling in this geometry with you know um, w with this hierarchy. It's also pulling in this metadata that we're able to use in new creative ways. Um, and the Unity Reflect Viewer is something that we get out of the box now that we can um, build out, and we don't actually, if you don't have experience with Unity, and you don't want to build anything custom on top of this, you don't have to. You can actually just use their out-of-the-box application, um, as well as uh, other software. So this is a really important one, um, is that you know we're not only using Revit. We're using whatever we need to use um, to use the best tool for that job. Um, and that's something that's really, really important. We're not trying to force all of these different software to do what they aren't good at doing. We want to use the best tool for the job, and we need the tools that are interpreting these models to be accessible and to be able to use whatever we are using. Um, and then being able to now distribute to multiple different platforms, we're using a whole bunch of different hardware. Again, best tool for the job. Some problems are more easily solved in augmented reality and lend themselves to that, whereas some problems you don't need to be on site and overlay anything. It's um, even more accessible and informative to um, put on a VR headset and immerse yourself in that space back in the office. And so allowing us to have all of these different endpoints is really, really necessary. And then the last piece of the puzzle is to customize. So now we have the ability to grab all this information from the software, pull it through Reflect to keep all of this data and be able to customize on top of it to do whatever we can come up with. Now that we can leverage all of this metadata, we can come up with really, really creative and novel ways of leveraging this data to create value-add products um, on the other end. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about, we don't have a live demo here, but I'll talk a little bit about, you know, if you want to build on top of Reflect, this is kind of how it goes. 
So here we are, we have a, you know, an editor view here. And I went through this really quickly in the demo yesterday during the keynote, but um, when you bring in a model to Unity Reflect, it is actually instantiating that model into this um, Reflect prefab that you get when you pull in the Unity Reflect package. And it instantiates this model within this root game object. And once you pull it in um, the first time, you can dig around, um, see what you get on the other end. And what you get, of course, is a one-to-one -one direct correlation between the BIM data that you had and uh, now you have all of that same BIM data accessible within Editor. Um, and as you guys know um, better than most, we can write something very, very simple that just looks into these parameters, grabs whatever piece of information that we want, and now we can do really, really interesting things. So I'm going to show a little tiny bit of code here <clears throat> that was that um, custom script that we showed yesterday, which just toggle, which just changes the material of each of those exterior window panels based on that panel status parameter. So all we're doing here is, can you see my mouse? Yeah. <clears throat> is we're tying into the Unity Reflect event system so that we get that on project open event as well as that on sync updated event. So if there's right when we pull in a model, we know we can run a function, or right when a model is updated, we know we can run a function. Then under here, this is how we just grab that panel status parameter. That's the specific piece of data that we were looking for. And we're just looping through all the objects that have that parameter and changing their material based on that status value. And that's really all we're doing. It's that simple. <clears throat> awesome. And so now we're going to show you a few things that we built with Unity Reflect. Uh, I just want to quickly uh, just go back and, and make one thing a, a little bit clear, that this, this idea of customization, that we're, we're going into the Unity editor, there's actually different ways that you can look at that. Uh, what, the projects that we're going to show, we're, we're taking the, the Reflect prefab, this Reflect viewer, and really embedding it into our own projects. Uh, but the other thing that you can do is you can use it as an importer into Unity. So if you wanted just to have a static import, uh, maybe we're, we're deploying to a client and we don't want them to have live access to our Revit model, we can, we can import that into the editor as a static piece of geometry with a metadata, and then we don't need to use the Reflect Viewer anymore. Um, so there's multiple different ways of that customization in the editor that this can work. So it can be a live thing in our own scene, or it can be a static import into our own scene, or we can, you know, all the code is there uh, of the Reflect Viewer, so we can even go into their viewer and, and edit it and, and really mess around with it for what we need it to be. So it's, it's really fantastic and flexible for as, uh, whatever we want to do with it. As well as multiple models. So you noticed that in the demo of the on-site augmented reality application, the first thing that you saw when we dropped these BIM models on top of the construction site was just that subseller model. But then when we toggled to that section cut view, that's actually a secondary model. So that was a different export. So we can take ch different chunks and chain them together in, in, in interesting ways. Um, <clears throat> but we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so the first application that we built, uh, you guys saw, is this AR status tracking application for these exterior window panels. Um, this, again, is um, built on AR Foundation, so it's multi-platform. Uh, very, very easy to use out of the, out of the box there. Um, and we're able to visualize and interact with this BIM data live, grab whatever specific pieces of elements we want, um, and visualize them and do interesting things with them. That was really just the first step. Here is a video showing a little bit of this process. We have that side by side. You saw yesterday, if you change something in the, you hit that live link, you change something in Revit, now you're seeing that live update within the viewer. This is really valuable. <clears throat> as well as customizing and changing um, specific components based on that BIM data that we pulled in. And then this is again built on top of uh, AR kit. Um, which used an object recognition right there. Cool. 
and then I'll let Chris take it away for this acoustic simulation bit. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> this is just another uh, example of, of some of the types of tools that we're working on at Shop that are, are maybe not just uh, a visualization tool or, or a client tool um, that a lot of people are using Unity for, but really more of a design tool for uh, internally with, with our designers. So um, architect designers are very visual thinkers. Uh, and so we were looking for ways to take something that was not visual, like acoustics, and try to make it visual and make it interactive uh, with Unity. So typically, acoustic simulations, uh, you know, they're very technical things. They take a long time to run to get really accurate results. Uh, you, results are typically not intuitive to most architectural designers. You really need sort of an acoustic engineer to run these and, and uh, evaluate and analyze the results. And unless you're designing a, a, a auditorium or concert hall or, or something that's acoustic from the very beginning, uh, any kind of acoustic simulation, if it happens at all, would normally happen late in the design process. Uh, so for example, for like a school or a hospital where acoustics are still very, very important, uh, it's, it's often tough to make any design changes by that point because so many things have already been decided. Uh, and so we wanted a way, as I said before, to sort of make something that wasn't visual and turn it into something visual, but also to uh, give early design access to our designers in, in hopefully an intuitive way. So uh, as this alternative, we've been working on this project. Uh, it allows designers to visualize sound waves, uh, wave fronts in, in an architectural space. Uh, it's interactive controls, so unlike uh, an acoustic simulation, where you just run it once, this is interactive, it's real time, it's dynamic, you can change things, you can move things, uh, and get, get real time feedback from those things. Uh, so this was actually started, uh, this sort of research project uh, was started at the MIT Reality Virtually Hackathon, and, and it was Adam and myself, along with uh, Luke Garon, Zeyu Ren, and Sabrina Namowski. So I have to thank them for a lot of the work as well. Um, so here's just a quick, video example of what's going on, and um, prior to Reflect, so we had built, we had started this project at the hackathon where uh, you can, let me just sort of pause this, um, you can, in VR, you can watch this wavefront reflect off of the different materials. Uh, we had sort of started this at the hackathon, uh, but there's a lot of details, a lot of important details that we weren't really able to complete until we had access to Reflect. So when something, when a wave bounces off of a wall, it, it, the, the amount of intensity that it bounces off with depends on the surface material that it's reflecting off of. So a carpeted floor is going to absorb a lot of sound, whereas these solid panels here will reflect more sound, and those perforated wood panels back there will absorb the sound again so that the sound gets reflected out, but then once it's out, it gets uh, absorbed and deadened so that it doesn't reverberate throughout the space so that you can actually understand what we're saying. And so those differences of material uh, are parameters that live in Revit that we can then pull into Unity. And so this simulation, now that we have Reflect, actually uses those parameters as the wavefront is bouncing off of the walls to, to change the intensity of the wave as it reflects off of different materials. Uh, additionally, we can change the geometry because it's in Revit and it's live linked. Uh, if a designer goes in and, and they're exploring the space and they say, okay, well, what happens if we change the angle of the ceiling? We can do that in real time change the angle of the ceiling, and they can uh, experience what happens to, to the sound reflection from that change. So that, that real-time connection and that metadata import really sort of completed that circle to allow this tool to become not just a research project, but actually a, an iterative tool that, that is fast enough to go into, to make changes, to evaluate those changes, and, and repeat over and over again to, to really become, a, as I said, an iterative tool. All right, and last but not least, um, we were going to talk a little bit about the on-site AR applications that we're building, the implications that this has on the industry, and um, a little bit about how we envision it being used. So what we are calling this, and you know, we've seen this in a bunch of different ways, a lot of, uh, a lot of people are working on this a similar problem is, you know, in this interim before we uh, have robots building everything, um, 
Construction document sets, for people who don't know what construction document sets are in the room, it's uh, like a set of blueprints that we have to give to a general contractor in order to get the building built. Um, usually for large projects, they can be thousands of pages long, and they're very difficult to navigate through and be able to gain an understanding of how to actually get this thing built. And so if we can expedite this process into a new, more fluid process to help people understand how to build things, how to more accurately um, you know, build a wall detail connection to a floor detail, um, if we can give them new interactive and uh, immersive ways of understanding these processes, um, we can solve uh, design flaws quickly. And this is a very important thing. Um, so we're using Unity Reflect for this. We've, uh, personally, um, I've been thinking about good ways of getting BIM data into real-time engines for a long time. And, uh, and it's here now, and it's very exciting. So, um, you know, now what do we do with it? So we're able to take all of this BIM data as well as this geometry and overlay it on site and create these fluid experiences. We get to work with these on-site construction teams to not just understand, you know, what we think would be a good use case, but we get to do user testing. We get to go on site with the developer and with all of the different trades and all the different subcontractors and really understand what they would want in a product so that instead of flipping through thousands of sheets of drawings, we can actually have an interactive user interface that when we select a wall, we get all of the associated drawings of that wall. We know every single piece of information that shows anybody how to build that wall is instantly given to you. Instead of, if you have experience with construction documents, <clears throat> which I hope you all do, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, it's, 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 a, it's a game. You have to check one view, and then that view directs you to another sheet that directs you to another sheet to check a detail, to, to check a schedule, to check a, another sheet. And it's, it's just not a fluid process. And we think that we can make this better and faster and allow our teams to, um, to do the QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control process uh, in a more intuitive way. And so that's what we're really excited about. Um, again, here is this tower, uh, and here's a video. So right now, this is using an image tracker. Um, we're doing a lot of research and development. Hopefully, um, I'm, I'm very excited to hopefully try and build in spatial anchors here um, and get rid of these trackers. There's a lot of very difficult problems to solve. Um, as construction sites change, you're going to have to reset your spatial anchors because they're not going to understand their surroundings as their surroundings are changing. Uh, image anchors. Image anchors are also not great because um, you're going to build a wall on top of your image anchor and then you're going to have to reset all of your origins. There's all of these problems that we're having to solve in, in interesting and new ways. Um, and we're, we're really trying to, um, to push what's possible with this technology and see how we can add value onto the construction site. <clears throat> That's all I have. So if you have any questions, uh, we would love to answer them. We have lots of time for questions. Yeah. Is this yours? Uh, yeah, you can use it. Anybody? Yes. I'm sorry, could you maybe go up to the, the microphone? The question was um, for the localization for the on-site AR application where we're looking up at the Brooklyn Tower, what did you do to localize that? And uh, Chris will answer that. <laughs> For now, it's, it's actually we're just using a, a we, we get the, so there's two parts. There's localizing it, but then there's also getting the geometry of the city so that you can occlude the buildings that are there, and you can use those actual buildings to occlude the, the augmented reality building that you want to put in. So, I mean, currently we're actually 
doing it pretty simply. We're, New York City, you can get all of the buildings in New York City. They're available online. Uh, and then we just have a map, and you sort of place yourself on the map. And so uh, we're looking into solutions for the, the problem with the GPS isn't quite accurate enough, so even with that, you still need sliders to really position yourself accurately. Um, we are looking at solutions that are emerging for, for positioning the user more accurately with just using the camera. Uh, those solutions are in progress. They don't exist currently yet. Uh, I have a question. When, uh, from your own experience, when you link uh, a Revit model, uh, do you have a way to filter all the data, or do you just link it uh, all together? Mm -hmm. Because you have a lot of many objects which sometimes you don't need, like uh, bolts and screws, and you have uh, 100,000 of elements with a uh, mesh uh, component, and uh, that makes an issue. Yeah, so um, there's a few ways that we can solve these issues. So the way that Unity Reflect works is that it is view-based. So, well, you noticed in the demo that I actually toggled from that model that had all of the geometry for the entire tower to a model that just had those exterior panels. And then I sunk that view to reflect. So it only exported that specific geometry. So that's kind of a pre-processing step is you could set up, you know, in Revit, you could set up a filtering system or, um, you know, you could just set up a specific template uh, with visual, uh, with visibility graphics and uh, export that. So that'd be a pre-processing. You could also do it on the Unity side with a post-processing um, if you wanted. I assume that would be the worst, uh, the worst way because you're still pushing all that data through. Um, but yeah, there's several ways to solve that. Over Hi. here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, do you have any ways to, uh, that when you're using augmented reality and you're just you uh, looking at the, the construction side, do you have any ways of measuring how long, how much work has been done? Um, uh, is the stages of um, the building, is everything completed in time and so on? Can you do that? Uh, measuring this wall is so high right now, but it should be that high. Some, is that a question that's understandable? <laughs> um. <laughs> Yes, so it's an interesting, that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> so you've seen the on-site AR demo that we created as well as the panel status tracking demo. So we can really create new custom parameters for, of course, whatever we want. Um, so for, you know, for every element in a Revit model, we can create a status parameter and input whatever type of value we want. Um, so we could potentially, you know, have somebody on site inputting that um, status to a specific element, where, whether it is, you know, um, not finished or whether it is finished. Um, yeah, if, uh, like a compare. Are you? Are you? Or are if, you? Are I'm, you speaking more towards like a comparison? Yeah, yeah. I, w I would like to uh, be able to measure if if the work is done. Uh, if if I can measure that the wall has been physically built up to a, a stage, and then I would like to show is the, is the contract is it done with this work or is he going is he going is he going to do more work? I mean, at this point in time, we're still, it's still a human, you know, we create an interface and a human goes in and looks at it and says, yes, it's done or not. And even that is still uh, a very useful tool that somebody on site has this on their phone and they can make those measurements and they can change it. And then someone back at the office sees those changes update in real time. That itself is still a useful tool, but we're not, we don't have any sort of automated image processing or scanning. Yeah, yeah sure, yet. that'd be great. Uh, you know, it's just the two of us developing things. So we don't, <laughs> we're not at that point yet. Uh, certainly, we think that's where the industry is going, and, and we're interested in those types of developments. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I like the, the whole idea of uh, having a model-based uh, communication model but I, I wondered if it is already uh, bi-directional, by which I mean if I'm in virtual reality exploring a new building and I want to make changes then and there, can I communicate them back to our 
uh, Revit or CAD model. Re reflect is not currently bidirectional, but maybe there's some other input on that. <laughs> uh -huh. Or be it, be it requests. Their APIs aren't really built for um, bidirectionality, and mm -hmm. frankly, we don't really want to be a, a, a DCC tool. Um, okay. So I could see it for something like, uh, uh, you know, RFIs in mm -hmm. something like BIM 360. That's what, that's the kind of application that's built for bidirectionality. But design tools are not really designed um, for that. So applications like Fuser do it. I'm not sure that's mm -hmm. really, that they do it really well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really more about review. Okay. Um, I, I will just add that one of the great things that we love about Reflect is that it's, yes, it, they have the, the pre-built viewers, but it's also just a Unity package that you can go in and you can add whatever features you want. So if there's something like that where you know, we have our own database that we're communicating bidirectionally with and we can, we can coordinate that with the Reflect viewer to, to achieve sort of sending some data back and forth because that's, it's in Unity, and, and Unity is amazing. <laughs> I was not paid to say a that. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> for it. Okay, my name is Christoph Mischgeusen. I'm educating architecture students in VR and simulation technologies in Berlin. And at the moment, we are doing this with the old-fashioned FBX import uh, yeah, from uh, yeah, over Cinema 4D from Architecture or sometimes or Revit. And from your point of view, what are the main advantages if we would switch to Unity Reflect for the students? Uh, yeah. Oh. I, I mean, it's just so much quicker to get changes in. I mean, currently, so currently it's, if they're designing in Revit, you know, it, it helps a lot. Um, I don't know what the, the roadmap exactly is for supporting other, other design software that you might be using. Um, I, so I actually also teach architecture VR uh, in the States, and, and just, you know, they have their designs in Rhino, and, and the process of getting that into, they, they have to first optimize it in Rhino, and then they have to export it, and then they have to import it, and that process just takes so long that they're, they're spending a lot of their time doing that process, and they're not designing, and they're not evaluating, they're just processing so much time. So Reflect, it, there is no time to process. It, you hit a button and it's done. And so really all of their time can now be spent either in the design software designing things, or it can be spent in the viewer analyzing the results, and they don't have to worry about that, that, those technical details at all. Uh, it just makes it a lot faster. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Quick question about the optimization. Uh, do you also use it for visualization purposes? Because one of the my main concerns is uh, uh, I, I kind of do s similar stuff, but they also want to have those uh, really nice graphics. But getting the BIM models, is, there's really a lot of manual work in optimizing that so you can bake lighting and do stuff like that. Are you working, uh, are you doing that manually or is uh, how's the process in that? This was aimed yeah. at me. Yeah, yeah if you want to. <laughs> um, so for like high-end design visualization, so the process you know prior to Reflect to get anything into Unity was to go into uh, an application like 3ds Max and do a bunch of decimation and and fake lighting and, and a bunch of other stuff to give you you know to to make it ready for real time because data coming out of Revit isn't really good for doing high-end design visualization just out of the box, right? Um, that will continue to be the case. If you really want to do that high end, high visual fidelity, you're still going to want to go through that process. Um, Reflect will help you sort of get yourself set up so that you know what it is you're, you're going to want to do, but that's still going to be the process that you're going to go into 3ds Max, you're going to you know, bake in lighting, you're going to do texture op optimization, you're going to do decimation. Um, and Reflect isn't, is, the, the visuals that you see out of Reflect today, um, they're pretty good. They're, they're going to actually get a lot better, and they're going to take care of a lot of your design biz needs, but that really high, rich visual fidelity thing is still going to go through the traditional process of going in and out of 3ds Max. Thanks. Hi, yeah. Um, got a question about, you obviously do very well with Revit and Reflect because it's got very tight links, but you also use Rhino, you also use Katia. 
How do you deal with those data sets? Because presumably the data that comes from those applications is much more valuable for constructability of buildings than uh, data from Revit. That's an excellent question, and, and we're going the old-fashioned way with those currently. <laughs> um, you know, Katia has a bunch of built-in VR tools that are, are nice and handy, but you know, we still want to customize our own experiences with, with the stuff that comes out of Katia. Um, so currently, we're, we're just sort of doing it the old-fashioned way where we're exporting uh, the geometry and the data separately, and then importing them manually into Unity later on. And, uh, so, you're, so you're bringing metadata from those applications into Unity still? But, we are. But you're we, having we, to do a lot of process to get that to work. We're, we're doing it through like a CSV or through some other file. That it's, it's, you know, it's not live, it's not real time, it's, it's a process. And, and yeah, you can optimize that process, and it's not that long, but it's still annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. But, and, and is Katia becoming more important for you because it has that manufacturing data than we, product like Revit? You know, we, we do a, a bunch of different projects, uh, and certainly in, in New York City is sort of the old uh, traditional method of, of producing construction documents and getting reviewed. We don't see that going away anytime soon for building buildings in New York, uh, but we are very interested in the opportunities in the AEC industry for, for process innovation about delivering buildings to construction companies. And so for those areas where we can, we are very interested in using CATIA for, for that route. OK, great. Thank you. But you know, specifically, though, to reflect and things like CATIA or SolidWorks or, or other you know, DCC applications, um, we talk a lot about Revit because it is the 800-pound gorilla of the construction industry. Um, but Reflect is really just a, a system. Right, it's a chassis, and you can build things on top of it like they've built, but you can also build pipes into it, uh, which we will. So we've talked about Revit, but there's a SketchUp plugin um, that's in beta now. There'll be a Navisworks, there'll be a Rhino. Um, we will continue to build other connectors into Reflect. And you'll be able to combine this data, right? So it's not just um, Revit going into a, into a project. You can also take Rhino data and push it into a project. You can take SketchUp data and push it into a project. All of it together and federated. Um, so we're not just building a, a Revit connection. That's just the one that we talk about a lot because it is so, so broadly used. But will you have that same, I mean, you've got a very tight relationship with Autodesk. Will you have that same kind of relationship with the other ISVs that you'll be able to sort of dig into the data and pull out which bits you want? Or will some of it be file-based? Uh, none of it will be file-based the way that we're thinking about it today. Okay. Um, will we have connections to other applications? We'll, we're, we're, we're neutral. Um, we love all the manufacturers. <laughs> cool. Okay, thank and, you. And their users who will buy my product. Yeah, thank you. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Sure. sure. Uh, I'm an expert elite for Autodesk. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm an expert elite for Autodesk, and they're already um, in development of Revit into Inventor and Inventor into Revit. So that's not going to, I mean, all the MFG files that you create in Revit, I mean, that you create in Inventor, is going to be on Revit soon enough. Um, so yeah, I, I just have the minor question continuing on to the last one. So uh, as a community, will we be able to create our own plugins for, uh, um, well, maybe not Katia, but uh, um, Rhino, for instance, because they also have a large open source part. Um, is there going to be a C++ API or something uh, in that kind of stuff? Uh, we'll build Rhino. Uh, we will likely make all that source available, just like the viewer is a package in Unity, and you can look at that, that source as well. Um, the intent is to make that available so that you could build your own connection. You could add on to your own connection. If there's a failing in what it is that we have built, God forbid, um, we'll, you know, you'll be able to make corrections to that. That's, that's the plan as of today. Cool. Thank you. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. In the state of today, can you import also linked uh, um, information uh, to Revit, like uh, DWGs or IFC files? Or is it pure uh, uh, Revit uh, data that you can uh, link? DWGs, I do not think so, but I would like some clarification if anybody on the Unity team knows. IFC. If you have geometry in Revit, it'll come through. <clears throat> but it's not file-based, so you're not bringing an IFC file into Reflect. 
Uh, and uh, what do you then bring? Uh, it's whatever is open and it's a memory to memory connection. Okay. Right. So whatever is open in Revit um, can be passed into Reflect. All right. Thanks. But I would add the plan is to add a connection to AutoCAD if that was your question. Hi. Uh, I have a question about servers. You said that we can use a Unity Reflect servers. So how it actually works? So we need to open some Revit or it stores some data, some conversion on servers. So uh, if I understand it correctly, so, so there's a sync server that when you, when you run Reflect, it lives on your computer uh, locally. I mean, you can put it probably anywhere in your network. But for us, when we're using it, basically it will live on our computer. Uh, and, and so if, if we have, we could have multiple Revit files go into this server project and then pull from that server project into Unity. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. So if I understood you right, uh, you mean like a client host, that is your computer will be host, and as a client that connects to your computer can use this model. Right, so currently uh, I think the, the current build only works locally. So for example, if, if we're out on the job site and we have the hosted data uh, on, on our computer in the office, we're not gonna be able to get to that, uh, but yeah. it, yet. Um, <laughs> So if we want to actually use Reflect on the job site, we bring the computer with us and we create like a, a local ne network there, and then that laptop becomes the, the host, and then all the different you know clients on the iPad or in the Hololens or wherever. Uh, we don't actually have a Hololens yet, but um, those we don't have the newer Hololens. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, any technical questions? I also want to point out the Reflect guys will be in the booth in the expo, so go talk to them about all of these. Any other questions you have for technical things about Reflect, go talk to them. Uh, if you want to talk to us about architecture and, and interactive visualization development, uh, you can catch us outside or we'll be around the whole week. Thank you, guys. Thank you.